I thank you for being coaches. I think sometimes us coaches, we have the toughest job in the world, right? We work with kids. It's public. It's emotional. We keep score. We work with parents. And yet everything that we say and everything that we do, we don't get to pick and choose what kids remember and what they forget. And yet those words can stick with them for the rest of their lives. And so it's so important that we're constantly working to get better, constantly working to learn about the latest and greatest research and science and best practices and approaching our coaching with an open mind, right? That, that we're looking at our coaching and saying, what's next, what's next. And in my work with changing the game project and new podcast that I started with my friend, uh, Dr. Jerry Lynch, um, called way of champions. Um, uh, you know, what we, what we talk about all the time, I get this opportunity to talk to coaches all the time and the best coaches are the ones who are the lifelong learners. The best ones are always looking for, well, what's next, what's next. And they're, they're always open to maybe I could take something for that. So the fact that all of you are on here right now means that, that you fall into that category. So I, I want to start by saying how much I appreciate you and appreciate that you care about the kids so much that you're willing to, you know, not be a coach who relives the same year, 20 years in a row, but is, is a coach who every year of your coaching gets better and better and better. Um, so what we're going to talk about here tonight is why kids quit sports and what we can do about it. And, um, if you have any questions, you can ask them, you can type them in there on the side. Uh, I'll try to get to them as I'm going along. We'll also leave some time at the end for a Q and a, uh, because I want to help you guys out as much as possible. So don't be afraid to ask a question. Don't be afraid to, uh, throw a comment in there and then Billy can help out with questions at the end uh, as well. And then I'll give you my, all my contact info at the end as well. Uh, if you have something that you want to email me directly, I'll give you my email address and everything like that too. So again, thanks for being here. So we're talking about why kids uh, quit sports. And as, as Billy mentioned, this uh, statistic that we deal with a lot, right? Seven out of 10 kids quit organized sports by the age of 13. And that number uh, varies across sports. But I think it's one of the greatest, um, I think, crimes is that organized sport has become something that a lot of kids don't want a part of. And in this day and age, when there are so many distractions, when there are so many other things that they can do, right, from video games and uh, online and movies and streaming, there, there's so many other distractions, we have to be better at sport. And one of the big myths is that, you know, oh, well, it's just the kids who aren't good. They're, they're the ones who quit. But sadly, no, because uh, so many of our kids are starting so much younger and pouring so many hours in to their younger sporting experiences, a lot of times at 12, 13, 14, we're losing the best kids. The kids who have been on every all-star team, on every travel team, they're just burnt out because we've put a 20-year-old's hours into a 14-year-old kid. Uh, on our podcast this week, I spoke to a man named Chris Snyder, who's the director of coaching education for the United States Olympic Committee. So he's working across every sport with some of the top coaches in the world. Um, and one of the things that he said was really cool in you know, athletic development, 11 is not half of 22, right? The, the amount of hours an 11 year old has in a sport is not supposed to be half the hours of a 22 year old elite athlete. Those hours can come later. So we're going to talk about tonight sort of um, a, a chunk of, you know, why kids quit and, and then what we can do to sort of sort of change that. And as, from a coaching standpoint, from a club standpoint, from an athlete development model standpoint. But uh, before I do, I, I just wanted to talk about why this is so important. Now, one of the scariest things for me, I have two kids of my own, nine-year-old and 11-year-old. It's this, that today's 10-year-old children, for the first time in history, have a five-year shorter life expectancy than I do, than their parents' generation does. And the reason for this is inactivity, right? All these other distractions, cutting physical education in schools, cutting recess time in schools, 
And what we know, as this slide shows here, is that physically active children, so in adolescence, right, um, age 10, 11, 12, children who are active at that time in their lives are far more likely to be active for the rest of their life. One-tenth is likely to be obese, higher test scores, less smoking, drug, pregnancy, more likely to go to college, they earn more money in their lifetime, lower health care costs. And then as you go through the cycle, they're also more likely to raise active kids themselves. So really, I think our role of sports and then even more specifically in the game of football or soccer, it's, um, it's not just a sport issue, this is, this is a wellness issue. And so we really have to focus on, I think, um, wh why, why are kids walking away, right? First, why do they play? And, and the number one reason, and I don't know any coach who doesn't ever get this answer, and I never speak to a group of parents who doesn't get this answer, you know, why do kids play sports? Because it's fun. Now, an eight-year-old is going to define fun differently than an 18-year-old or a 22-year-old elite player or an Olympian. But they'll still say, because it's fun, because I enjoy doing this. Um, and so we have to really focus our stuff on, well, what makes it fun? And not, you know, why do they walk away? What makes it not fun, right? And, and um, you know, some of the things that make it not fun, um, not getting playing time and um, criticism and yelling, fear of making mistakes, uh, all these things make it not fun. So we're going to dive into what I think are really the five big reasons why kids walk away and then give you an alternative at the end of, of each of what you, we can do as coaches, as club directors, as influential people in these kids' lives to get back to, you know, keep more kids in the game. <laughs> now, one of the things I think is really important is – in the United States, there's now been some research done on athletic development models and coaching and training. And one of the really fascinating statistics that I came across, so the, the first sport in the United States to institute an, an ADM, an athletic development model, was USA Hockey. Um, and I know I'm never supposed to, as an American, talk about hockey with Canadians, but I'm going to. Um, well, one of the things that USA Hockey did was they put in this ADM 10, 11 years ago, and they've really tracked uh, player retention. And here's a fascinating thing. When you compare hockey to a sport like soccer in the United States, um, soccer in the U.S., of all nine-year-olds playing soccer, by the age of 14, only 60% of them are left, right? So we lose a huge number of kids. That's millions of kids here. Whereas in USA in hockey clubs that have instituted this American development model, um, what they have found is this, that the retention rate of nine-year-olds to age 14 is 91%. When you do it right, when you play cross ice or when you play small-sided games, when you train your coaches, when you give people appropriate amount of time off, when you use your ice time well, when you do games-based and randomized learning, kids stick around. And so I think on this whole uh, ecosystem of, of, of sports and soccer in specific, when we talk about development models, when we talk about the research, what the, what the latest research is showing is that when you do things the right way, kids stick with it. And when we do things the wrong way, kids walk away. So what does the wrong way look like? So um, the number one and the biggest thing we kind of talk about this, right? When it stops being fun. And so um, there's a great uh, document by the Aspen Institute in the United States that they have an initiative called uh, Project Play, which is for 12 and under kids um, trying to reduce this dropout rate. And a woman named Amanda Visick from George Washington University did a study. And, and she asked kids, you know, why do you play sports? And nine out of 10 said, well, because it's fun. So then she said, well, what makes sports fun? And kids came up with 81, 81 separate characteristics of what made sport fun. Um, this was the top six, you know, trying your best and working hard, being treated with respect, getting to play, playing well together as a team, getting along with your teammates, exercising and being active. This is what makes sports fun. And then of these 81 characteristics, here's a couple that came in far lower on the list. 
winning number 48. Now I think, you know, as a coach myself, right. And, and as Billy said, I mean, I coached, I've coached everything from six year olds to 26 year olds. And, uh, I know that I've never showed up at a game thinking that there was 47 things more important than winning for the kids, but uh, apparently there is, um, according to all the research. And <clears throat> it's not that as coaches, we, we don't want to win. And it's not that we don't try to win, but it's just not necessarily, especially for really young kids, what drives them. Now, I want to stick on this point for a second because I think it's really important. Number one is this, that, that you know, according to researcher Jean Cote, um, kids go into sports uh, and they go down two paths, right? Par sport for participation and sport for performance. Now, I think all young kids who enter sport, especially, and, and again, soccer is this, this great gateway sport. Um, when, when we, um, you know, when they enter, they're there on a participation thing, right? I've never yet met the five-year-old who's been like, all right, coach, you know, I'm here to work today. I'm here to grind, right? No, they're there to play. They're there with their friends. They want to learn. They want to run around. They want to blow off some steam on all the sugar that their parents gave them on the way there, right? And then kids, you know, some kids go down this performance path. They're a little more competitive. They're a little more serious. Maybe they're good. Um, and what happens, I think, sometimes, especially in team sports like soccer, is that far too soon, we take the entire group, the 10 kids or the 12 kids or the 16 kids, and we say, all right, guys, we're off the participation path, and now we're on to the performance path. Well, not all those kids want to be there. And what happens is when you take participation kids and you throw them into the performance pathway, um, you know, they're not serious. They, they don't want the year round commitment. They don't want all that travel. They don't want to get screamed at by a coach who's worried about the result. And so they walk away. And by the same token, the kids who are on the performance path, if we force them to stay in that participation uh, ethos, you know, they get bored. They want more. They want kids who are at practice paying attention. They, they want to know that if I give a pass and run, I can get a pass back. And so I think it's one of our jobs as coaches is to, you know, be part of organizations that create both pathways. And if we are part of a club um, that is really good at the participation side of things, let's be really good at what we are and, and let kids leave with our blessing, right? You know, it's time for you to move on. And by the same token, um, it, you know, it, we just, if we're on that performance side of things, signing up as many kids as possible at age 12, as many teams as possible, when that's not what a lot of those kids want. That's not a, a great thing either. So I think we have to explore this idea of, of where does winning fit into this. Playing in tournaments, practicing with specialty trainers, uh, you know, I, I like the last one, right? Getting team pictures taken. That's, that's one of my favorite ones. So I think as, as coaches, number one, if one of the reasons, if the number one reason why kids quit is because it's not fun, then we really have to um, focus on, well, what makes it fun, right? And, and that's these things again, right? Encouraging kids to work hard, you know, respecting them, you know, respect and encouragement, getting playing time, playing well together as a team, all these things, these have to be our focus. Um, number two reason why kids um, drop out is, is they lose ownership of the experience or they lose control. And, and this little graphic here is from my book, Changing the Game, <clears throat> where I talk the seven C's of a high performing state of mind. And one of those seven C's is, is control and ownership. Um, York university, um, in Toronto, I believe, uh, there's a, a, sports researcher there named Joe Baker. And he says, um, the three critical ingredients for long-term athletic performance are autonomy or control and enjoyment, which we just spoke about and intrinsic motivation. Right. And, and then let's take that one step further. When kids own something, then they develop competence, right? And when they develop competence, then they develop confidence. And those things all work together. But it all starts with giving kids ownership of their experience, really figuring out, well, why are you out here? What is driving you to be here? And how can I give you more of that? Now, a, a lot of kids lose control. And I, and I think there's two big reasons or two big places where, where they're losing it a lot. Um, and so here's the first one.
yes, this, this push for early sports specialization. And, uh, you know, I, I know it's always hard to do webinars because I always think that's funny and I don't get to hear anyone laugh in a webinar. But, um, you, you know, you know, Bill, uh, Billy was telling me that at your last uh, soccer summit last year, you had a gentleman from the UK talking about early sports specialization. And I, I do a lot of travel. I mean, last March I was at Manchester United. Uh, this past March, I was just at Barcelona, at La Masia, working with a coach from Ajax, working with a La Masia coach. Um, and, um, you know, th this topic comes up a lot. And throughout the world, I think they're, they're really starting to see that this push to, to force kids to do only one sport younger and younger and younger is not necessarily uh, a healthy thing. Now, sadly, there, there's a lot of coaches in the world who still are out there quoting this idea of you got to put in your 10,000 hours, you got to put in your 10,000 hours. And, and the sad part about that is it's just not true. There is no such thing as a 10,000 hour rule, something that Malcolm Gladwell made up in the book Outliers. Right? Um, he, he, he took the work of a researcher named Anders Ericsson, who's got a great new book out called Peak, if you want to read it. Um, but Erickson's work was really on the quality of practice people did. And he had done some research on um, a very small group of musicians and found that on average, these musicians had done around 10,000 hours of practice that they self-reported. But when you think about that, A, it's self-reported, and B, you know, some of these musicians were elite after 5,000, and some musicians were not elite after 25,000. So it wasn't necessarily the hours, but it was the quality of those hours is what Erickson was really getting at, what he calls deliberate practice. Well, Gladwell turned this into the 10,000 hour rule, right? That you have to do 10,000 specific hours of training in order to, to be elite at something. Um, and it, it's, just, it's just not true. Plus, when you think about, you know, A, a sports is a little bit different from music, and, and, and B, it's kind of pulling those hours of training out of out of context. So th think about it this way, right? If we asked all the centers in the NBA how many hours of practice they had, and they, on average it came back that they had done 9,000 hours of basketball, and all of a sudden we said, all right, uh, if you want to be a center in the NBA, you need to practice for 9,000 hours, right? That's what's going to get you there. Well, it kind of ignores the, the thing that, well, yeah, it also helps to be seven feet tall. Um, so we have to be very, very careful with this number. And yet there's some very highly expert coaches out there still quoting this idea that 10,000 hours is, is science, and it's really not. What the research does show, what the science does show, is that children who specialize in a single sport prior to the age of 12 are far more likely to get injured to the tune of 70% far more likely to burn out and drop out and quit, and far more likely to have psychological identity issues. Now, I met a man named Tony Strudwick from Manchester United. He was Alex Ferguson's first team fitness coach. Now he works with the youth. Um, a couple of years ago, he presented at the NSCA convention, um, National Soccer Coaches in the United States, and he put up a slide right there. It said, every child under the age of 12 should play more than one sport. And here's one thing that I promise you, that if you have a young kid who's part of Manchester United, they do play more than one sport. They don't play travel basketball or travel baseball or rugby or something like that. But within the Manchester United scheme, those kids that Man United has hired parkour coaches and circus trainers and, and tumbling trainers, and they do martial arts. So they're getting a, a multi, maybe not as much multi-sport as a multi-movement experience as young kids. And what that helps with later on is uh, better all-around athleticism, which prevents injuries. And what happens is that athletes who get injured a lot when they're, when they're in their teenage years, they cannot accumulate the hours of practice necessary to break through to that first team early on. So staying healthy is one of the most important qualities of a young player trying to break through. A Marcus Rashford, you know, who always played up but he always stayed healthy versus some others and Tom Cleverly, a Cameron Jackson who, you know, they played their own age, but they, they were healthy and they didn't miss training versus others who maybe were a little bit better, but constantly got injured because of the lack of all around athleticism. So we have to be very, very careful with this early specialization. And as the pro clubs are looking at it, 
And as the pro clubs are making sure that their kids are not single sport athletes, I think it's really, really important that us as youth coaches do the same. If we are part of a club that has a setup that allows kids to do gymnastic movements and martial arts and everything through uh, your club, great. If not, you know, find times of the year where those kids can get away for a couple of months and just do something else, which helps to prevent the burnout and, and the dropout. But I think this is an incredibly important thing that we're losing a lot of kids to this game because of this. We're also losing a lot of kids by, by making kids make this decision far too soon, right? You have to specialize at this age or we have no spot for you. And we lose a lot of great athletes um, who, um, you know, decide, yeah, that's not for me right now. So if we can create an environment where kids can follow their own path and we can train them well, and we can keep as many kids in this game as long as possible, give them the best environment possible, then good things happen, right? Then when they hit puberty and they grow, we'll have a far better base of players than if we select them out really, really young. Um, the, the second thing that I think really is lack of um, loss of ownership is I, I think a lot of parents are driven by this fear of missing out, right? If my kid doesn't make the A team at eight, if my kid doesn't specialize early, if my kid doesn't give up everything and hire the private coach and do all this, um, he or she is going to miss out. And we've lost patience in the development process. We've lost, um, we've lost sight of the fact that every child is on their own development path. Some talent, as I just wrote a blog about, some talent shouts and some talent whispers. And we can't just be people who select the talent that shouts. Now, you know, the work actually came out of Canada, a psychologist named Roger Barnsley on hockey players, this idea of relative age, right? That whatever our arbitrary calendar cutoff is, um, the, uh, you know, the kids born within four months of that arbitrary calendar cutoff are far more likely to be selected as all-stars or travel players or whatever at a really, really young age. Um, when I was just in Barcelona, you know, talking to a La Masia coach, 92% of the kids in La Masia, Barcelona's youth program, are born between January and June, right? So it just shows how powerful that relative age bias is. Yet those young kids, those small kids, those non-early matures, like a Xavi who was born in September, right, they develop these other characteristics. Yet so many parents are so afraid of their kids missing out, they just force them to do whatever they want, to work with a private coach, to give up everything else, or they force them to do multiple sports or whatever it is, and, and the kids just burn out and then they drop out. And I like this image of just the mom running down the sideline chasing the play. Um, I think we also know this as, as coaches sitting on the sidelines, listening to, you know, I, so my daughter, you know, I, I sometimes show this video of my daughter at her first piano recital. And when she makes a mistake, no coach is yelling at her. None of the parents in the audience are yelling at her. Um, they're okay with her making a mistake. It's fine, right? She's just learning to play piano. She's supposed to get it wrong. But you go to a soccer game of this age and what are all the parents yelling? Shoot it, pass it, run, go. And we steal ownership. In, in this incredible game that we all coach, you know, the, the intelligence, it really has to be on the field, not the sideline, right? It's, it can't be the, the um, parents telling kids when to run, when to jump, when to pass. And it can't be the coaches. It's got to be the kids solving those problems over and over and over. It's got to be us, instead of telling our right back, hey, Johnny, step up and pinch in. Johnny, where should you be right now? So that they start figuring this out. But sometimes, again, this fear of missing out, this fear of what's wrong with my DNA, this fear of, um, oh, my gosh, if my kid doesn't get in position and they score, my kid's going to look bad and then he's going to feel bad about himself. No, your kid's probably going to be fine. Um, but it's such a powerful thing. Um, and, and again, I just wrote a whole on changethegameproject.com. I just wrote a whole blog on, on FOMO, the fear of missing out. But again, I think those two things, right, pushing kids into to specialize early and this fear of, um, and what happens when you have fear is whenever you're scared, you can't take the long view, right? You, you can't look at the long path ahead that developing as a footballer is 
something that takes many years and many hours and ups and downs and trials and tribulations and wins and losses. Um, when I'm scared, I, I don't look at what this could be in six years. I look at what's happening in the next six minutes. I look at what's happening in the next six days or six weeks. And I solely focus on that. And so I solve the kids' problems and I tell them where to be and I tell them when to be there and I scream instructions and I yell at the kids. And what ends up happening is I, I, I do everything that goes against developing creative problem solvers, developing creative decision makers, right? And, and, and kids who, you know, when you think about a footballer on the field, right? You know, they have in a split second, they have to figure out where are they on the field? They have to, you know, perceive their surroundings. They have to um, come up with a solution. They've got to, if they're good, add some deception to that, and they have to execute this task. How much input can they take in that second right there? How much input can this kid who's using every bit of his mental faculty to dribble that ball down the field and keep it away from those kids in yellow and figure out where the goal is and figure out where the next defender is, you know, how much is his mom yelling at him really going to help? right? It's not. It's just going to confuse him or distract him, but it's not. And and so I, I think this is something that we have to engage our parents with of don't be scared. Don't worry about missing out. Don't worry that your kid's on the B team. It's okay. Um, that really fits into, you know, number three, this idea, this focus on outcomes, right? That when we're really outcome driven, we, we lose patience for development. Now, one of my favorite stories is a story of uh, a number of years ago, um, very famous English soccer academy had uh, a, a talented 15-year-old, and they were trying to decide whether they were going to give him a scholarship to be uh, you know, a full-time YTS player at 16. And when he was 11, when he first joined the, the club, um, he was the fastest kid and now he's 15. He was going through his growth spurt and he was struggling with his game and struggling with his athleticism. So he'd gone from fastest kid to seventh fastest on his team. And all the coaches are going back and forth. Um, should we keep him? Should we cut him? Three voted, keep him. Three said, no, let's get rid of him and, and, and find someone else. And luckily they asked the scout uh, who had first found him when he was 10 years old, what do you think? And he said, I think there's something there. We have to be patient. He's going through a tough time. All right. He's struggling with this growth. He's learning how to play in his new body. Let's just be patient. So thankfully for Southampton, they kept Gareth Bale, right? Now playing for Real Madrid. Now um, certainly dealing with some injury problems these days. But, you know, they, they, they almost cut Gareth Bale at 15 years old, right? So if 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 we can't spot Gareth Bale at 15, how do we spot, um, how do we spot, you know, a nine-year-old or an eight-year-old? We really can't. Every once in a while, something shines, but most of the time, again, it's just keep all those kids involved. Just be patient. Don't let your uh, patience get, you know, outweighed by your expectations, especially when kids are really, really young. One of the other things that is part of the outcomes that people focus on is, is that sports is an investment, right? With a financial return. Certainly in, in the game of soccer in the United States, only about 4% of high school soccer players play the sport in college. Uh, and I think it's about, it's a little higher on the girls side, but like 3% of girls and 1% of boys get financial aid to do so. Right. And that awards about $12,000 a year. Certainly in the United States, the NCAA Division I scholarship women's team has 14 and a men's team has 9.9 .9 for a roster of, you know, 28 to 30 people. So there's not a lot of full scholarships bopping around out there. Um, yet so many people look at sport as an investment with a financial return. Now, sport is an, inve is an investment in character development, overcoming failure, overcoming obstacles, life lessons, all that sort of stuff. But when we start looking at sport as this extrinsic investment, right? When we look at it as this thing that, that has this tangible reward, all of a sudden, um, that's what players start to focus on. And one of the things they're seeing in NCAA now is a huge amount of kids who go to play and then quit after a year or they transfer. 
because their whole goal was get this scholarship. And now they got it and now they're done. And they've lost love, love of the game. I remember when I was in university in New York City, um, you know, as soon as the NCAA Division I season ended back then, uh, we were still allowed to play on outside teams. That next day, we'd all be playing in the New York City League, in the men's league. Um, and and just because we love to play. And I, I just see so many players now who are just, they're, they're burnt out and, and they're done. And um, we, we want people to play this beautiful game until they're 50, until they're 60, not look at 12 year olds and say, ah, you don't got it, we don't have a place for you. So that's number three. Number four is uh, again, why do kids walk away? This idea that they, they feel disrespected, right? And so in the same Aspen Institute study, you know, what kids want from a coach this is what kids tell us. Here's the top five things they want from their coach. Respect and encouragement, positive role model, clear, consistent communication, know what you're talking about, and someone who listens. Now, I'll do, if this was a live audience, we'd, we'd do a sticky note exercise, and I'd have you write down what are the five qualities of the best coach that you ever had. And I'm not telling you that these are the five things that you would put down. But here's what I can pretty much guarantee you, because I've done this activity all over the world um, in, across every sport from grassroots coaches on to the pros, is that um, when I ask those coaches, okay, write down these five qualities, 80 to 90% of the qualities that are put down have to do with connection, right? Not knowledge. Knowledge is important. Knowledge is crucial. You have to know what you're talking about. But honestly, especially young kids, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care about them, until they know how invested that you are in them. When, when they know that you care, then they want to learn. But so many times coaches don't look at these things, right? And so often when we're doing our coaching education, right, we spend 98% of our coaching education time on number four, knowledge of the sport. And we don't spend any time on the connection piece, on this connection between um, two human beings that we're trying to inspire kids, that we're trying to make them feel uh, understood and loved and cared for and encouraged. That we're, we, we don't need to coach a sport, right? We coach a person. And every kid that we coach needs something different from us. You know this, right? Some of them need a hug. And some of them need a kick in the butt. And it's up to us to know what they need, what each individual needs, and, and, and give that to them. Now, this is really hard, and I, I still coach, and it's a struggle, right, to really give every child the, the time they deserve, to, to pay attention to them on what's, what's wrong with so-and-so today. But when we look at some of the best coaches in the world, this is what they, they realize that coaching is not an X's and O's business. It's a relationship business. And when you work with your assistant coaches and you really tune in, and when you're working with kids and you develop this great relationship with their parents so that you're a trusted resource and you get those parents to tell you, hey, so-and-so is having a tough time of it right now. Hey, so-and-so's grandma died, so she's kind of not into it right now. Um, you know, that kind of stuff all plays into, you know, how we're able to connect to those kids. And so I think one of the most important things that we can recognize as a coach is that the connection piece that you might even think of coaching as X's and O's and coaching, that they're two different things. The knowledge is important, but we have to connect first. And when we connect through an environment of love and respect versus fear and intimidation, you reach more kids, right? You can get them in, invested for the long haul. When you model good behavior, right, then you can be a, a coach that, you know, a, a trusted organization that people want their kids with, right, and then you just be a good listener. It doesn't say on there, you don't make mistakes. Of course you do. You just um, aren't afraid to apologize for them when you do. Um, and, and one of the big things is, on this connection piece, is a lack of trust. Um, when we don't, you know, and so I, I was so guilty of this as a coach. Um, 
not understanding what trust is. And so this picture here is actually uh, this guy uh, taken kind of in your backyard in Ontario there. It's a guy named the Great Blondin. And his name was Charles Blondin. He was a very famous French tightrope walker in the 1800s. And he used to come uh, to Niagara Falls and, and walk across the falls. And he was this great showman and his crowds would get bigger and bigger every year. And um, he was always up in the ante. One year he like went out on the, on the tightrope and brought a, a little stove and a pan and he cooked an omelet and ate it, right? But in this particular case, he shows up this year with this uh, cart thing. And so he starts saying to the crowd, to rev up the crowd, you know, I'm the great blonde and who thinks I can walk across the falls? And of course, they're all cheering. And he says, who he thinks that uh, I can, you know, push this cart across? And they're all cheering, blonde and blonde. And, and he says, who wants to get in the cart? And it's crickets, right? Because trust is not just about your ability. You will not be trusted because you were a great player. You will not be trusted because you happen to win a lot of games. You will not be trusted um, because you can kick a ball really far. Trust is not just about your ability. Trust is about connection. We just talked about that. Trust is about being believable, right? Being all in with your team or your teams or your athletes and being dependable, right? Do you walk the walk or do you just talk the talk, right? Do you admit when you're wrong? The, these, as Ken Blanchard calls it, the ABCDs of trust. So when we are thinking about do our players trust us and do their parents trust us, it really has very little to do with what a great player you were. Um, and it has a lot more to do with can I connect with the kids? Can I connect with the parents? And am I believable? Am I a great communicator? Do I let people know what's going on? Right? Um, so then number five here, right? So, you know, kids walk away when it's not fun. Kids walk away when they lose control. Kids walk away when sports becomes only focused on the outcomes and did we win and not how much we learned, right? Uh, sports, um, kids quit when um, they, you know, when, when there's this lack of trust and they feel disrespected. And then I think number five is just when, the learning process is not respected and appreciated, right? When it's not safe to fail, when every game is too important to put in a kid who is young and is small and is just learning the game. Sorry, Johnny, we can't get you in, right? One of the number one reasons why kids play is because they don't get playing time, right? Um, when they can't make mistakes or they're afraid of getting subbed out, all these things are, 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 are a huge driver into why kids uh, walk away. And one of the biggest places is on the ride home after games. Uh, researchers in Australia uh, asked a bunch of parents and kids, you know, what makes sports less fun? And, and one of the top answers was the ride home after game because they're physically and they're emotionally exhausted. And yet, hey, we got them locked in the car and uh, we're going to make this a teachable moment. And what kids tell us over and over and over is that maybe this is the least teachable moment. And so um, I want to show you a quick video here. Hopefully you all have the streaming uh, to capture this. Um, and this, this is from an HBO show called Trophy Kids, a documentary series done in the U.S. Um, on the ride home. And it's an actual video of a, a dad and his son. And it, it's it's well worth watching. Look at the kid's face as he's um, as his dad is quote teaching him on the way home. Did you tell the coach to pick this other game? Yep. How many times? Are you sure? The basket right next to you. Dude, you're, you're not getting it done. Let me explain something. If you do something wrong, do I tell you? Yep. Okay, I correct it. Or I tell you so you can correct me. How do you know what to correct if you don't even know why he pulled you out of the game? What did I tell you about that? What, are you scared of him or something? So why don't you go ask him? Like right now, you know we're going to have this conversation after the game. You know it's coming. Okay, this is part of you becoming a young man. If someone does something, you're just going to take it. So if I was walk up to you and just slap you inside your face, what are you going to do? Just turn around and be like, I don't know why that guy did that. Doesn't make any sense, okay? You 
death like you're 10 or 9 or 8. And you're just going through the motions. If you're going to be selfish, you know what? You have other brothers and sisters. Okay? We'll take you from out of that school and give them a chance. Put them in the private school. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. It's an easy thing. What's the problem? You have more personal training than any of those kids out there. Okay. Back to the drawing board. Back up to getting early, back up inside the morning. Okay. Because it doesn't make any sense. You got to be driving back and forth from this school. Back and forth. Back and forth. Back and forth for you to go out and do absolutely nothing. Now, I don't understand why you don't get it. I don't understand it. So I think that video is a fascinating one. Um, <clears throat> in the actual documentary, what happened was this kid, Justice, he, he quit football, and he actually moved out from his dad as well. So going back, you know, six, eight months ago, we took this clip and we posted it on our Change the Game Project Facebook page, and um, it was fascinating discussion. Some people wrote in and said, you know, the poor kid, look at him, he, you know, he just doesn't look like, you know, he just can't take it. And, and other people said, um, that's just a dad with high expectations, right? Shouldn't, shouldn't we do this as parents? And I think that they're both right. I think that, that um, it's okay as parents to have these expectations, but just not there, right? Not there, not on the ride home. When, when a kid doesn't want to talk about it and that becomes uh, a 30 minute or one hour prison after every game where, where they're getting the 10th degree, um, where we don't take into account their state of mind. And um, what was really interesting as this back and forth went on was this guy chimes in in a comment. He says, I was the cameraman. I was sitting in the front seat recording that. And what he said was that, you know, the dad was an NFL was a college football player, NFL draft pick, who then got in trouble and never made it to the league. So he was convinced that his son was going to make it in the lead in his absence, in his place. But he never asked his son this. And it cost him his relationship with his son. So I, I just think it's so important on the ownership piece and on the safe to fail piece that the ride home is is a sacred space if kids want to talk about the game if they want to bring it up by all means right because a lot of us are parents too talk about it but if um if they don't find a better time to talk about it find a better place and i think as coaches this also this is the post game talk what do you absolutely positively have to say in that post game talk that can't be put onto the hotel that night or before the next training session, when your emotion and your player's emotion is out of it and they're actually ready to learn. Kids like to learn. Most kids are willing to be uh, have their performances critically evaluated, but not necessarily right after a tough loss, not necessarily right after a big win, right? It's okay for them to enjoy the win or, or struggle with the loss for a while before we start teaching again. And I think I became a far better coach when I um, started saying less after games. And I, I just think that's really good advice. Now, I, I think, you know, especially for those of us, and I'm one of them who, co if you coach your own kid, um, practice can never end if we're not careful, right? The games can never end if we're not careful. Um, and, and so we really have to be cognizant of their state of mind and ask them, would you like to talk about it here or would you not? And I do that with my kids all the time when I'm coaching them is, hey, would you like to hear a little bit about your game? If they say no, then that's fine. All right. When can we talk about it? Let's talk about it tomorrow. Sounds good to me. Right. So constantly monitoring that is really, really important. So. Um, how do we overcome these five things? And this is what I kind of want to finish up with and then have leave a little time for questions and stuff. So, you know, number one, 
if kids are quitting because it's not fun, we got to make it fun. And one of the ways to do that is ask kids what they want. I would guarantee you that all your players have some favorite things that they do in practice. Why not play more of those, right? Why not play more of the things that they love to do? Why not get feedback from your athletes, from your players of what makes this enjoyable and what makes it not and try to give them what they need, right? I think it's one of the biggest things that if you look at something that teenagers do a lot of that we don't have to ask them to, it's play video games. Well, what do the video game makers do over and over and over? They ask their users, how can we make this better so you'll play more? And I think we all have an opportunity as coaches to even when you're coaching higher level, what is the stuff that you guys really love to do? How can we make this better so you'll play more? And pay attention to the games that they love and, and use those sometimes as a carrot. Hey, let's get through this so we can play this. Right? You don't have to have a brand new practice. You don't have to have a, a brand new uh, session every single time. Do the same sessions that kids like that are effective sessions over and over and over. Um, that goes to number two, giving them ownership of the experience. What are their goals? Right? What do they want out of this? As kids get older, the more ownership that we can give them in creating the team mission and the team values, the better off we are. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, number three, right? Be patient, right? Let them all play. When kids are really young, right, they all have to get playing time. If you pick them, you play them. A college age kid, a high school age kid, he or she can understand that I might not get in this game, but not the little kids. Right, not the little guys, not the 12 and unders. If you pick them and they're showing up at practice and they're doing the best, you gotta let them in, right? And we've gotta be patient with their development. I've coached kids who were B team at 15 and you know one of the best players in the country at 18 because they finally grew. So be patient with development, make sure they play. Number four, this gets down to our stuff as coaches, right? We have to constantly be looking at what matters to kids. We have to constantly be looking at what do best practices say when it comes to randomized practice versus no longer using mass practices or block practices. I know Billy just did a webinar on this. We have to look at uh, the connection piece and realize that communication and connection, these things are skills as well. Right? And then finally, we got to just make it safe to fail. We have to see the big picture. And when kids do things with 100% focus, and 100% effort, right, and it doesn't come off, we can't get mad at them. We have to say you did the right thing, right? Just in training session I ran for U12 girls on Monday night, um, player went, played a ball back to the goalkeeper, and rolled under the goalkeeper's foot and into the goal. She feels terrible about it. And I said, well, you didn't, you know, you did the right thing. You played the right ball. What could you have done differently? I could have aimed my pass outside of the goal. So if she missed it, it would roll out of bounds. Great. Fair enough. Right. But you did the right thing. If I scream at her for that, what happens? She'll never play a ball backwards to a goalkeeper again. And now she's not learning how to play. So uh, my last thought for you is this. And actually last night in Vancouver, BC, um, or via, via video from the Vatican, uh, the Pope, Pope Francis, actually did a TED Talk. First time a Pope has ever done a TED talk. Um, and this was one of the things he talked about. And of course, he wasn't talking about sports, but he was really what he was talking about was the power of our influence. Please allow me to say it loud and clear. The more powerful you are, the more your actions will have an impact on people. The more responsible you are to act humbly. If you don't, your power will ruin you and you, you will ruin the other. And I just thought this was a really appropriate quote. Um, for our power as coaches and our influence as coaches because our influence is never neutral. Our influence is never neutral. It is either going to be positive or is going to be negative and therefore we have to be intentional about everything that we do. And if we can be more intentional about making it fun, about letting kids own it, about it being safe to fail, about creating an environment of, of love and respect, and about focusing on, on the process, getting the fear out of it, um, our 
our influence is going to be incredibly, incredibly positive. So here is all my information, our website, changingthegameproject.com. If you don't follow us on Twitter, uh, CTG Project HQ, uh, Facebook, and just look for Change the Game Project. And then, as I said to you, there's my direct email as well, John at Change the Game Project. Uh, if you want to get a, a free PDF of my book, Changing the Game, you can uh, enter your email at changingthegameproject.com forward slash free CTG book, and you'll be able to put in your email and download it. And then there's some other stuff we have. Um, my friend, Dr. Jerry Lynch, and I just started this podcast in the bottom right, The Way of Champions. Um, we just had, uh, like I said, today we had the director of coaching for the U.S. Olympic Committee um, coming up here very soon. Uh, I've got the U.S. international soccer player, Jay Demerit, incredible story of being an undrafted college player and making it to the English Premier League and the World Cup. Um, I have uh, Tony DiCicco, World Cup winning coach from the United States coming up. I just had Ashton Eaton, two-time Olympic decathlon champion. So it's a really great insight if, if you like to listen to podcasts on, um, you know, what are the things that the world's best athletes, the world's best coaches, and the world's best scientists and researchers are, are, are learning about athlete development so that you can go back to your teams and create your own culture of champions. And then uh, Jerry and I do a three-day conference every year on leadership, on how you build culture and uh, mindfulness and visualization for athletes. That's coming up June 2nd to 4th in Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, you can register at changethegameproject.com forward slash WOC conference. I don't know if anyone here was there last year when we did it in Boulder, but it's a super fun event. Uh, my colleague Jerry has won uh, 36 NCAA titles. That's what we're teaching you. And um, and uh, he works with a pretty good basketball group right now called the Golden State Warriors. So what we teach, uh, it's proven to work. So I think that's all I have for you. If you have any questions, you can type them in there now. Um, I think I'll be able to see them. And we've got a couple of minutes to answer questions. And obviously, Billy, if you have one, you can jump in and ask it as well. All right, I got one from Jordan here, if I can see it. Any suggestions on how to give control to U4 to U6 players in a beginner soccer program? In my experience, I have focused on giving children choices within their program. What game do you want to play? Any other tips to put children in the steering wheel? So I, I think, Jordan, that's a great question. And, and those kids are really, really young. And I think one of the most important things that we can do with, with really young kids is keep them moving, right? No lines, no lectures. Uh, certainly no laps, um, but being prepared to switch from activity to activity to activity. Now, one of the things that I truly believe in with kids that age is the whole part, whole methodology. And that would mean when my kids show up, we play. We play for the good first 15 minutes and we break it down into one to two activities and then we play again at the end. Um, there's a great uh, guy named Horst Veen. Uh, Fanino and the youth development model for soccer, very, very influential in Spain and Germany and, and, and Barcelona, Ajax, uh, his methodology and his Fanino with that age kids, he plays 3v3 to four goals. So each team defends two and attacks two goals, 3v3 games, because what happens is with attacking two goals, it starts to pull the game apart. It starts to pull the bunches apart a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, the, the more developed players will say, oh, there's space over here because there's defenders here. And the clever kid will say, oh, there's defenders in front of that goal. I need to go to the other one. So the game starts teaching. Um, and, and I did a whole season when my son was six, every single practice. Um, that's what we did, right? They'd show up and play three V three to four goals. Um, uh, then we'd break it down. And during that 3v3, I, if I was going to talk about 1v1 dribbling, that's what I was encouraging. See if you can go by him. See if you can go by him. See if you can take that player on. And then, um, and then at the, you know, we'd break down to some activities that encourage that. And then we'd come back at the end and we'd encourage that again. So even in that first game, 
I'm starting to emphasize the coaching point that I'm going to make that day. But again, they're going to have favorite games to play and don't be afraid to play them over and over and over. Don't be afraid. Just like I'm pretty sure that, you know, Jordan or anyone, um, you know, anyone on here, your favorite movie, you've seen it more than once. Um, well, guess what? Kids are very happy to see their favorite practice more than once. All right, let me see if I can, my, my cursor has disappeared here off my screen, so there it is. Uh, all right, so Colleen, uh, coaches coaching their own kids, um, composed most of the provincial travel teams, connections and money, um, politics, favoritism at early age, um, kids caught in the middle. Uh, numbers for competitive teams are, are lower, only 18 pick regardless of whether you have 22 or 50 who play at that level. So i um, not quite sure what your, what your um, question is there. Um, but again, I think having coached my own kids, it's always a challenge, right? You're always, you know, most of us are actually too hard on our own kids because we don't want to be seen as, as playing favorites. Um, and um, yes, without a doubt, there is politics and favoritism at early ages as the people who step up, of course, their kids are going to make the team. Um, there was a study done uh, for the U.S. Olympic Committee by a man named Dr. Matt Robinson. Um, and what he looked at is actually that a lot of these programs that rely on volunteers, if they actually find and train young coaches and, and pay them where they can kind of get that, um, that uh call it cronyism, favoritism out of there. Um, actually, they have higher retention rates as well. And then numbers for competitive teams is exactly why um, we need to um, stop worrying about how soon we play competitive, right? We need uh, more players playing, less travel early on, less barriers to entry and all that. So very, very important. Uh, 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 all right. So, uh, Martin, great question. Is it bad to not play your kid up so he can stay with his friends or do you move him up to help his development? So I just wrote, uh, I think two weeks ago on changingthegameproject.com a whole article on whether you should play up or not. Um, so I, I would just encourage all of you to go there and, and, and read that because it really kind of encompassed, um, you know, a lot of my thoughts on that. What I would say is, is um, number one, it shouldn't be, you know, especially when your kid's really young, playing with his friends might be more important. Um, jumping in on a practice now and then with some older kids or a, a female with a boys team, if that stretches them as a player, that's a good thing. But, um, this should always be evaluated on an individual basis. Now, one of the things, one of the reasons for, when you look at like a long-term athletic development model and you notice that those stages are an age range, right? It doesn't say hey, at nine, you do this, you say between nine and 12. And that really is looking at, you know, when kids hit their growth spurt, because when they hit their growth spurt, there's physiological differences in terms of trainability of different skills, um, um, anaerobic versus aerobic training, things like that. And so sometimes if you have an early developing kid, right, he's bigger, stronger, faster than anyone else. Yes, it's good to play him with some kids who are his developmental age. Um, and, and so he can't run by him and now he's got to develop some guile. But you always have to look at your kid and, and say, A, is he still loving this? Because the social aspect can still matter. and and B, um, what about the maturity piece, right? Do you want the fourth grader playing with eighth graders, even though he's capable of it? You know, what, what sort of influences and conversations does that put him near that go way beyond soccer, right? So it, it, it's a tough thing, but I just, uh, again, I highly encourage just just read that article. I think you'll enjoy it and uh, get something uh, out of that, Martin. Great question, though. Um, have I come across any differences in dropout in big cities versus suburbs, Allison? Um, great question. I don't, I couldn't cite any statistics for you on, on that. Um, I think 
in suburbs, especially in small towns, we feel it more because we don't have anything to replace them with. Whereas in big cities, um, we can always find another kid next door playing on uh, another another club. But I, I, I can't accurately answer that question and I apologize for it, but it's, it's a really good one um, as well. Uh, Samuel asks, have you looked at the influence of creating a community safe space on a soccer team for youth retention? Uh, I think some kids don't follow sports because they don't feel welcome. Yeah, that's great. Um, I would look, uh, Iceland has done a ton of, a ton of work in this. Um, obviously Iceland punches far above their weight per capita, a couple hundred thousand people and a Euro quarter finalist. But what Iceland has also done really well is they've cut the use of teenage truancy and drug use way down by creating safe after school spaces for kids to go. And it's not, obviously it's not just, just to play soccer, um, but basically YMCAs or these community centers, but they've built all these Cruyff courts and sports courts all over the country where kids can just show up and after school and Hey, that's where you go. Right. And, and it's made a big difference. So I, I think Iceland as a nation, um, has a lot of great evidence on creating that welcoming um, space. There's also a guy, and I think he's in Minnesota, um, named Ted uh, Croton, I think, and he's got an organization called Joy of the People. And I would look for Joy of the People as well. And he's basically just created this great space where kids can show up and play. It's basically drop in seven days a week. There's no coaching. There's no yelling. There's no whatever, just the kids uh, not no yelling, but no adults. Um, it's just kids sorting it out, but it's a safe space and it's a very welcoming space. So um, yeah, check out Joy of the People and Ted, and I always mispronounce his last name. I think it's K-R-O-E-T-E-N. Janice, how do you inspire a kid at 11 who you see the skills but does not have the motivation? Hmm. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I'll keep refer. you know, I, I think one of the really important things for whether a kid, you know, that there's a great quote and it says the world is full of uncommon people with talent. Um, and just because someone has a lot of skills or they're fast or they're strong doesn't mean that they are going to have the, that motivation and that competitive drive to be really good. And I think as coaches, we can't necessarily give someone competitiveness but we can create an environment where it comes out and that's creating that safe to fail environment. That's creating a team value system where teammates are, you know, they, you, you're talking about how important it is to compete and you're rewarding those and you're catching people good to do it. Um, it's also worth looking at Carol Dweck's work on fixed versus growth mindset. Um, this idea of a fixed mindset that your abilities are, are, are fixed a lot of fixed mindset individuals, what happens is they won't go all in. They won't um, challenge themselves because they believe that I'm either good or I'm not good. And if I go all in and give my very, very best effort and I fail, well, I just must not be good at something. Um, and so check out Dweck's work on, on mindset. And I found that a lot of kids who aren't motivated, it's just because their mindset is fixed and it's up to us to change the focus to the process and, and change them to uh, this, this growth mindset, um, which is really important. Um, uh, James, um, it's difficult to employ this philosophy when the culture of the sport is increasingly toward all year round. My season ended in September. My club forced me to take field time all fall and winter. Amen, man. I, I hear you. And I think this is where, as, as coaches, um, we are always – finding that balance, right, of, of what's best for the kids. Can we change the culture from within? Can we be flexible uh, with our group of that? You know, again, to, to get together once a week and, and play a bunch, I don't think is a bad thing at all. But creating the space for those kids to do an extra season, talking to them about, you know what, you, you need some time off, by all means, go ahead and, and, and take that time off. I, I mean, I've heard your story, James, many times. I had a friend of mine coaching in Maryland and he tried to give his nine-year-olds or is it you at U nines a month off and his coaching director came and said, these kids have already had two weeks off. We're getting back to practice. Right. So it's really, again, the people who are doing that, it's not based on 
science. It's not based on research. It's not based on what's best for the kids. It's based on this fear that if we don't do it, they'll go to a club that, that does do it. And, and it's a really hard thing. Uh, I don't have a perfect answer for you, except, you know, try to be the change, try to bring uh, good information to your people, um, try to give people a year long plan. When you are in season, you know, make it a good, strong commitment and, and, and tell people, Hey, you know what, you know, we're all in and, but when we're done, we're done, take some time off. But when we're here, be here. And I think, you know, when you can periodize it that way and you, you, you know, now we're switched on, now we're switched off. I think families appreciate it. And so do, uh, so do, um, players. All right, Vicki, what do you suggest say to parents believe that children need to run laps, do drills, when at all costs, bring them around and believe that children need to enjoy the game to stay in it? Um, you know, Vicki, I think all you can do is share the science, share the research, say this is why we're doing this and this is why. Um, I think anyone who thinks that it's important to run in laps, um, you know, I always say to people, we know better now. Right. We, we, we know better. We know that randomized practice works a lot better than mask practice. Every book on education shows it. Every bit of research in sport shows it. Um, and especially in a game like soccer, where it's all about decision making, if you separate your technical training from the decision required, you're teaching a completely different, quote, skill. Right. You, you are not teaching the same thing because, you know, you, you can have a kid kick a ball against the wall over and over and over and over, and they can get a great first touch. But then in a game on the move, when they have to assess where are all the defenders, where are my teammates, where am I in the field? How fast am I moving? Where do I have to run after I play this pass? What foot do I play it to? Um, none of that exists with the wall. None of that exists with two kids passing a ball back and forth. And so you have to bring them the science. You have to bring them the methodology, this is why we're doing this. And then you also sometimes have to realize that maybe it's not for them, right? That that they're never going to come around to what you do. And I had a you know great friend of mine who played 70 international games for the US who had, you know, three people quit when he was volunteering to coach his son's U10 team because they thought they should be going to more tournaments. So instead of uh, having an international, you know, World Cup level player, they went to someone else who had never played because he was willing to take him to tournaments. So <clears throat> when it happens, uh, don't take it personally. <laughs> uh, uh, John, good question, right? So we should all learn every position in the 77 game. A uh, player is definitely afraid of playing goal. Um, I, I think goalkeeper is, 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 is different. Um, I, I certainly do think that um, in seven aside soccer, um, you, you know, at that age, more important than learning positions is positioning, right? When to give width, when to give depth, uh, when to check, when to, to get away. And this is what we learned through rondos and position play games in that formation. I love rondo based games where the principle of play that we are teaching in that rondo then applies to the big field. Hey, did you see the wide players on the rondo had to support both squares? What happens when the ball gets played forward in this seven aside game at the end of practice? Where do the wide backs have to go? They got to step up and through. So, um, yeah, I would say goalkeeper might be one position where, um, uh, you know, let the kid get in there and practice a little bit. Say, just give it a shot. See how he does. See how she does. I don't want to assume it's a he. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's okay to say, hey, we're all doing our turn. Most kids who are afraid to play net, they're just afraid of letting the team down. And so you're, you're, you're pointing out to them that, you know, I just heard the U.S. national team coach Bruce Arena said today, someone said, oh, all the American goalkeepers in MLS are struggling. You know, this guy made this mistake. This guy made this mistake. And, and Bruce Arena said, really? You mean none of the strikers have made any mistakes in their last couple of games? Gosh, that's fantastic, right? Because we just, you know, the mistake that a goalkeeper makes ends up in a goal. When the striker makes a bad touch, no one cares, right? Um, you know, he can get nine wrong. And if he gets the 10th one and the 11th one right, he had a fantastic game. Right. The goalkeeper gets nine right and makes one howler. He had an awful game. Um, so, you know, just 
don't let that kid be afraid to fail. That that might be that might be the 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 best piece of advice, and, and that might just you know come from you or pressure from his parents. Uh, playing football, that's so great. Uh, Tristan, in terms of training players who are at different skill levels, what's the best way to train them? Do we keep better players together? Certain drills and scrimmages. Um, yeah, so this is a great question, Tristan, and this idea of of tiering players. Um, I certainly believe, again, as the Swedish psychologist John Falby says, <clears throat> the most players possible, the best environment possible, as long as possible. But within that environment, we can tier kids, right? If you've got 59-year-old boys and the difference between player number one and player 50 is so vast that they shouldn't, that, that they're not helping each other, by all means, tier your practice so that you know, one through 15 are working together and, you know, three groups, four groups, whatever it is, but they have to have access to the same level of coaching. I would encourage you to make sure that some of the kids at the bottom of the pool get a lot of work with the, your best coaches because they'll move, they'll catch them up quicker. And what that's what you want to do is, is, is catch those kids up. Um, and, and the same access to facilities. The, the problem that happens is we get people who, at eight years old say, these are the best 12, we're going to pour into them and forget the, the next 20. Right. And, and we lose out on all those kids. And then we wonder why there's only six left at age 14 or 15. So I think you have to look at your group um, and, and recognize, Hey, in certain things that we can do, right. We can have them all mixed and trained together. Um, and then certain times we need to split them, but I do always encourage they should be on the same field at the same time, feeling that they're part of this group and that there's also fluid movement amongst the levels, right? That a kid at the B level who's doing great, kick him up to the A. The kid who's struggling with the A's, create an environment where he or she doesn't feel like they're missing out if they go with the B's and have a little more success. So I do believe in training as long as it's access to um, um, the, the same type of stuff. Uh, it looks like I got one more from Mike. Um, uh, how do you get a PDF of change in the game? Sure, man. So, uh, again, if you just go to my website, change the game project.com forward slash, and then you see on the yellow at the left free CTG book, <coughs> uh, you can grab it right there. <coughs> It'll ask for your name and email, and then you'll get to, uh, download it. So I think I have answered all the questions, which is good because um, I'm out of water and I'm starting to lose my voice. So uh, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. You have been uh, fantastic. Great questions, great discussion. And like I said, if you have any more, feel free to email me. Uh, if you have any questions about our conference or the podcast or anything like that, um, you know, we'd love to help you out. And hopefully I'll be back in Ontario here soon. Thanks, guys. Billy, anything from you? So he's Dave here. Billy's having some technical issues with his microphone, as we heard before. Um, first of all, John, I just want to say thank you on behalf of Ontario Soccer. Um, we also want to remind everybody that we've got upcoming webinars um, soon. The next one is, is actually Billy on uh, May the 10th, where we're talking about incorporating physical literacy into grassroots programming and also to stay in touch with, with us. Uh, on, the, on our newsletter and our social media accounts and obviously please check out the Changing the Game project um, that John, John has mentioned so um, thank you again for everybody for joining us and thank you so much uh, to John for, for, for this evening and again we hope to see you all on our webinar soon, thank you Cheers, thanks guys